pretty easy to see that we're seeing the utter collapse of the Christian worldview in America and throughout the West, right? That's not hard to see. But the question is, from our perspective as Christians, why is this happening? I think a better way to word that question is why isn't the church, why aren't Christians influencing the culture like we used to, you know, years ago? Think back to Billy Graham's day. And guys, here's what we suggest. Because so often today, guys, it's the culture that's infiltrated and influenced the church. That in so many cases today, Christians have compromised God's word in different ways, in different areas. We've undermined biblical authority. As a result, we're seeing the collapse of the Christian worldview. That what has taken place and is taking place is an attack on God's word. Yes, outside the church, that's true but also inside the church. And the consequences have been catastrophic. And the fact that God's word is under attack, well, that's nothing new, right? It's been under attack since Genesis chapter 3, when the devil said to Eve, did God really say? And guys, notice what he was doing there. He was getting Eve to question God's word, to doubt God's word, so ultimately she would reject it. And that method was so effective He's used it ever since. Different forms, the same basic attack. And guys, one of the primary ways he is doing this today, right now, and for multiple generations now, is through the teaching of things like evolution and eight men and Big Bang and especially millions of years, using those ideas, those secular ideas, to get multiple generations to watch this, question God's word, doubt God's word, and reject it. Same basic attack with a different stealth twist. Notice what he's doing today. Today, he's attacking the Bible's history to undermine the Bible's authority, to undermine the gospel based in that authority. Well, God's bottom line is this, to put it bluntly, if you cannot trust the clear history of the Bible, why on earth would you trust what it says about salvation? If you can't believe the earthly things of the Word of God, why trust it on the heavenly things? If you can't believe the beginning of this book, why trust the middle or the end? And for so many people today, especially younger generations, but not just them, this is their stumbling block to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And guys, the people understand this best are the secularists. They understand this is a great way to attack God's Word by attacking it at the foundation, that history in the book of Genesis. Give you one example of this. Show you a quick clip of this guy. His name is Lawrence Krauss. He's a professor of physics over at Arizona State University. Clip back from 2009. I want you to hear what he says. Hear the reaction of his students. And as you do, just bear in mind, this is a great example of how and where the attack is happening on biblical authority today. The amazing thing is that every atom in your body came from a star that exploded. And the atoms in your left hand probably came from a different star than your right hand. It really is the most poetic thing I know about physics. You are all stardust. You couldn't be here if stars hadn't exploded because the elements, the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, iron, all the things that matter for evolution weren't created at the beginning of time. They're created in the nuclear furnaces of stars and the only way they can get into your body is if the stars were kind enough to explode. So forget Jesus, the stars died so that you could be here today, okay? And and anyway. This is great. And you can determine for yourself which one is worse, the statements or the reaction of his students. But notice the basic sentiment that's conveyed throughout our culture today. Forget Jesus. Forget Jesus. He's not your Savior God. Why? He's not your Creator God. You're not here because God made you like the Bible says. You're here because stars exploded. Bottom line, he's basically saying this. The Bible's wrong about the beginning. It's also wrong in the middle and the end. This same guy said later on at a different conference that change is always one generation away. So he said, if we can plant the seeds of doubt in our children, and that sounds a whole lot like Genesis chapter 3, religion will go away in a generation or at least largely go away. And watch this. He says, this is what I think we have an obligation to do. Thank goodness he's neutral. (laughs) 
No such thing, right? Either you're for Christ or against. Either you walk in light or you walk in darkness. There is no such thing as neutrality. But he is right about one thing. Change is always one generation away. We see it in God's word on numerous occasions. We see it happening right before our very eyes. According to numerous studies, now for multiple, multiple years, we're recognizing that around uh, an average of around two-thirds of kids today who grew up in church and Christian homes, go to church consistently, two-thirds of those kids, they're walking away from the church by the time they reach, by the time they graduate high school, by the time they reach college age. Two-thirds of kids who grew up actively involved in church are walking away from the faith after high school. And that's been consistent now for multiple generations. That's a staggering number, and that's on the low end of the, of the estimates. And according to research, one of the main reasons this is happening is because for so many today, they think you cannot trust the Bible in this quote-unquote scientific modern age. That it's been bombed out by these sort of secular ideas. And then guys, parents, grandparents, pastors, Sunday school teachers, here's the kicker. They're coming to us for answers. Hey mom, dad, grandpa, pastor, Christian friend. If the Bible is true, well, then what about evolution? And what about the eight men we talked about yesterday? And what about dinosaurs and the Bible? And how do you know that marriage is one man and one woman? How do you know there are only two fundamental genders? And how do you, who did Cain marry? How do you have answers to all this? Give me some answers if the Bible is true. And you know, what has been our response as Christians in general to those sorts of questions now for multiple, multiple decades? It's been something along these lines. And guys, I said this for a long time myself until God got a hold of me on this. But we've been saying something like this. You know what? I don't know about the rock layers or the fossils or the eight men or those other issues, but don't worry about that stuff. Just trust in Jesus. And of course, hear me. We want them to trust in Jesus, no doubt about that. But also hear this. When we ignore their questions and we just say that, we're actually ignoring their fundamental question, which is this. Here's what they're really asking. Here's what the world's really asking. Why should I trust in your Jesus. Because the message of salvation through Christ alone, that message comes from where? This book. And hey, Christian mom, dad, grandpa, pastor, if I, can't believe this, if I cannot believe this part of the book over here, why should I trust the rest? Either all of this book is authoritative and true and trustworthy, or none of it is. Ultimately, this is a biblical authority issue. And guys, that's why this stuff matters so much. But because for so many generations, we've not answered questions, we've not equipped ourselves to stand on God's word, we've compromised God's word in different ways, we're seeing so many testimonies today like this young man's. ...of how I became an atheist. I was born into a Christian family and indoctrinated as, uh, growing up as a kid. That next year was freshman year of high school, and I started learning about evolution in my biology class. Then uh, that's where I realized I had never seriously questioned or thought about my religious beliefs. So as I learned about evolution and just started thinking philosophically about it, I realized that there couldn't be a God. So I became an atheist. And I'm willing to bet that most of you know someone with a very similar testimony as that young man's. Because this trend has been happening for a while. Actually, here's a poll published by Pew Research. Looking at the weekly church attendance of people by their generation. And in short, basically it says this. The younger the generation, the less they go to church. The older generations go to church more often weekly. The younger they get, the less they go. Down from 56 to 44 with a silent generation. The boomers down to 32. Gen X, my generation, down to 27%. And the millennials down to 18%. And guys, as the millennials become the dominant group in our culture, in our church, what does this tell us about where the church is headed? That's their mentality about church and the things of faith. They represent the coming generation of leadership in the church. We're following the trend of what's happening over in England, Canada, throughout Europe, where average weekly church attendance has dipped into single digits. We're following in that same trend. And for Generation Z... The news is even worse for them. These are your teens of today. Generation Z, they are twice as likely as any other previous generation to declare atheism as their worldview. George Barner recently said this about Generation Z. I'll just read the quote to you directly. They said this, It may come as no surprise that the influence of Christianity in the United States is waning. 
rates of church attendance, religious affiliation, belief in God, prayer and Bible reading have been dropping for decades. Decades. Americans' beliefs are becoming more post-Christian. Oh, that is so true. And concurrently, religious identity is changing. Enter Generation Z, born between 1999 and 2015. They are the, they are the first truly post-Christian generation. This shows the trend of our culture. We're seeing the collapse of the Christian worldview. 66 to 88% of young people are leaving the church never to return. Creation or evolution, which do you believe? Um, I'd probably have to say evolution. Evolution. Uh, evolution. Is there any powerful argument that makes you think evolution is true that causes that confusion? Um, I think the studies that have been done on uh, apes and monkeys are pretty compelling. I think that the you know, genetic sequence can change over time, over millions and billions of years. Uh, mostly fossil records and just databases of really just the fossil records. In your church background, were you ever exposed to any scientific evidence for creation by your church leaders, pastors, anything like that? Definitely not. Nothing in particular, no. Uh, no, I don't believe so. Do you uh, still attend church today or, or not anymore? Um, only for holidays. We kind of stopped going together as a family, but... You see, there's one worldview that every single person in this country has been exposed to. The idea that evolution is true and that the Bible's account of origins is nothing more than fairy stories. Did your church leaders, student leaders, bring in any creation teaching that showed you there was scientific evidence to support the Bible's account of creation? Uh, yes. Yeah, we learned a lot about different um, creationist scientists and the proof of young earth creationism. What are you studying now? Biology. Biology, right. Steeped in evolution. So, uh, but you're not convinced by the evolutionary arguments in your biology classes? No. Still attend church today? Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah, every Sunday. Would it be fair to say then that being able to discuss creation openly at church uh, has helped strengthen you in that area, prepare you uh, for what you've learned here at college about evolution? Yes. We're becoming less Christian every day. How do we present the gospel in a secular culture like ours, where many today, they don't believe the gospel today. Why? They don't believe the book from which the gospel comes. How do we effectively engage them with the gospel? And how do we engage them with the gospel effectively in a culture where many today in our culture, they don't have the foundational biblical knowledge to rightly understand the gospel in biblical context for it even to make sense? How do we do that today? So with all that being said, we as a ministry like to suggest a radical idea for a powerful way to share the gospel in our culture today. We suggest a great way to share the gospel today in our very secular culture is to do it, it's a radical idea, the way God does it in the Bible, by starting at the beginning. Most people today do not realize that their science indoctrination comes by the way of the news, the single best mass indoctrination tool in existence. Did you know that your National Geographic is owned by 21st Century Fox, an American conservative cable television news channel, and you really expect honesty and for them to give you accurate, unbiased scientific information? 